Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Zulu's Painting Show. Uh, I'm Rob, and I will be your host for today. Sorry. <laughs> Technology is always difficult to do. Um, also, hello, Peter. How's it going? Uh, today, we're going to be diving into painting the Clan Invasion box. For those of you who are Battletech players, you'll be very familiar with this box. Um, in a previous episode, I showed you how to paint, actually, the mech that we're going to be using color scheme similar to, um, but I realized that I'd kind of dove in about halfway through. So what we're going to be doing is going through the processes, the steps, uh, to get to the point that you saw the model uh, in the previous episode, and then we'll sort of continue along uh, with some of those basics. Today, specifically, what we'll be going over is the... Um, the, the process of deciding where colors will go. Um, Battletech minis are a lot of fun because they have a lot of options, a lot of places, a lot of things you can uh, you can do with them for their color schemes. Um, the, the paneling on them is particularly convenient for, for doing such a thing, but where to put those colors is always sort of the question. So that's kind of what we're gonna be diving into today. Um, as you may have also seen in previous episodes, I normally paint my inner sphere mechs as Com Comstar, which is almost entirely white. So for the clan mechs, I decided to go with a much more colorful version uh, and went with the clan Cloud Cobra uh, that has a very sort of interesting turquoise and purple and metallic paint scheme. So let's go ahead and dive down to our uh, other camera angle so you can see what's going on. There we go. So first things first, uh, this is the miniature that you'd seen before. Let me go ahead and adjust the old focus for you. Oh, oh, there it is. Um, so as you can see, we've got that nice teal coloring with some highlights of purple and uh, metallic. And you can see on this leg, we've done a little bit of battle damage. We've done some rest. Uh, we're not going to really be going into that as much. Uh, you can watch the previous episode where I talk about how to do that. Uh, what we're going to be doing is figuring out how to go from this, or sorry, from this guy here to this guy here. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. So as you can uh, see, this uh, mech has already got uh, some paint on it. The uh, priming process is not a particularly interesting one to watch. So that's not where we started. Uh, also, the lighting is just very bright. I'm sorry about that. Here, we're gonna go ahead and start with this uh, while we're playing around with the whites. And then when we go to our colors, that it'll, we'll, we'll brighten that light up again. For some reason, uh, white uh, just has a hard time showing up on the camera. So this first step uh, was pretty simple. You take your matte black uh, although, I, for some reason, my matte black turned out much shinier than I was expecting. Either way, uh, you hit the whole thing with a, a black prime, and then you take your white primer, and you point it straight down from the uh, the top, and you just hit it with a quick spray. And as you can see uh, from the underneath side, it still is very, very dark, um, but from the top is very light. So what we're doing here is essentially creating that, that sort of color gradients um, the, the sh sort of shadow, uh, versus, uh, highlights, um, in our model before we've even started putting paint, uh, sort of any of our real colors on it. I just realized my mic is kind of a ways away. Let's get that guy a little closer. Hey, much better. However, as you can see, we don't, uh, we still have a lot of very sort of, uh, dark areas. Um, there's a lot of spaces that would have, uh, light hitting it that hasn't been just purely by virtue of of how this sort of the priming works So what we're gonna do uh, for that is we're gonna go ahead and do some dry brushing with a white So we're gonna go ahead and grab our army painter uh, matte white Put a little bit on our dry palette. Oh first. Let's shake it a bit Got a little paint shaker just off screen. Sorry for the hum. Uh, last week I ended up accidentally muting about uh, 15 minutes of the video, so I'm gonna, that's, I'm gonna make sure I don't do that again. So we grab and put a little on our uh, wet palette. We're then gonna go to our dry brush. Uh, 
you get just a little bit on the tip of your brush. And then uh, counterintuitively, you're going to go to a, an absorbent piece of, uh, of like, a, like a napkin or a paper towel, and you're just going to wipe the paint away until it no longer is, is leaving uh, much uh, paint on the paper towel so that you can give sort of a light dusting of your model and it's not going to... It's not going to put a lot of paint, but it's only going to catch the high points there. So again, we want to kind of maintain that look of a uh, of a top light. So we're going to be uh, uh, trying to really just dry brush down, trying to get more of those highlights, really show off more of these armor panels and these. These uh, new sculpts are great for for this because they just they have a lot of uh, a lot of interesting sort of panels and um, shapes. We just want to make sure that we can get get all of those those details. Now, when you're doing your dry brushing, you want to uh, to make sure that oh oh man, <laughs> the black and white is always kind of hard to see. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, you want to really make sure that you're not getting into sort of the recesses. Uh, you really just want to hit the highlights of uh, the pieces of the model. Now, the reason you don't want to really leave it to just uh, leave too much black on there is if you're use if you're working with a contrast paint uh, or or even the thinned down um, uh, layer layer paint. Um, if, if you have black still on the model, uh, it makes it hard to, to sort of see that color. So we want to we wanna create that contrast, but we don't want to make it... Um, we don't want to make it so that it's, it's too extreme. Now, if you'll notice, uh, some of the spots that I've, I've dry brushed have a sort of kind of dusty look to them. Uh, that is okay, because when we start putting our... Um, our contrast paint on this, it's really gonna, it's gonna, uh, it'll take the shading of it, but it won't really show that kind of dusty look, which is convenient. So, you'll go over the whole model until it's, uh, the level you like. As it happens, I actually had one that I'd already, uh, uh done beforehand. So once you get it all dry brushed, you have a nice model with uh, contrasts between the lights and the dark spots. And once you have that, it's time to start putting some color on it. For this particular one, I'll be using uh, a contrast paint. Uh, for this color scheme, uh, I used oh, sorry, um, the, oh goodness. Turdan Turquoise? <laughs> sure. The, the names of these are always a little bit interesting. Hello, Vincent. How's it going? Don't forget to shake your paints uh, thoroughly, as always. Dive in. So for this layer, we're going to go ahead and turn to our monster brush uh, it's just a nice nice big set of bristles so you can really fill that uh fill up your brush because for this one you're really just gonna cake it on there uh you don't for us especially for this this contrast layer uh you really don't want to be shy with your your paint um now you'll notice there are some places that's going to try and pool on you that's okay uh, you've got a pretty long working time with this uh, with this color, so you can move it around and uh, make sure that it's got proper coverage of the entire mini. And then uh, at this point, yeah, it's just you know making sure your whole model gets covered. And this stage, it's really important to make sure that you really get everything, because um, this is this is your this is your base color. So basically, everything is gonna sort of be 
kind of kind of go from here. Uh, I thought of nooks and crannies. <laughs> That's always the fun part about mechs. They're uh, they're very sort of visually complex things. It's one of the things I really enjoy about this these most recent sculpts is they're they're really really interesting sculpts. Oh, give me just a moment. A little bit of technical difficulty, just gotta make sure everything's running smoothly. And you'll have some spots that will will sort of it be they'll be a little little thicker. Just kind of go back over them to make sure that they're not they're not pooling too much because you'll get a very dark color, and you really want to let the the thinness of the contrast paints show off the uh, the color underneath. So I'm gonna adjust a little bit. There we go. And as you can see, as I'm as I'm covering up these, uh, especially the arms, because I think the arms had the most sort of dusty look to them, uh, they're they don't have that sort of dusty look anymore, which is convenient. I mean, if you want your model to have a sort of like it's fighting on a uh, on a dusty planet sort of look, then then absolutely you should keep it. But it's nice to have these guys look a little bit more clean. So if you've never used a contrast paint before, uh, they operate, they're very similar to a, uh, a wash, uh, with the, with the di biggest difference being that they don't sort of flow into the recesses in the same way that washes do. Uh, so they're, they're a thin paint and, uh, they're designed to kind of show the colors from underneath. So there's a lot of really interesting things you can do, uh, with these. And I, and I might, I might try to take an episode to play around with um, sort of having your your base color uh, kind of show how it, it'll change the, so your, sorry, your undercoat uh, change the sort of color of your contrast. Um, almost using the contrast to sort of bring together a color scheme for uh, a model. So you don't have to use contrasts uh, with with the zenithal prime. Uh, actually, I've discovered that a um, just having sort of thinned down paints uh, with a with a zenithal prime can work very effectively. You can you can really uh, see that under color. And if nothing else, as you'll kind of see as we're going through with our purple, uh, knowing sort of where the highlights should be is very informative uh, to to your paint scheme. So anymore, even when I'm not planning on using contrasts, I'll a lot of times do a zenithal prime on my model just to kind of really see where the details are. Uh, I've noticed that when I get my base color on, sometimes I can sort of lose the, the details. Um, it becomes kind of hard to see the little details uh, on the model. So uh, the zenithal prime just sort of helps bring that out. All right. And look at that. We've got, uh, in a relatively short amount of time, we've already got a layer of color on this guy. And a, and a very dynamic color, which I, I thoroughly enjoy. Um, and you can kind of see it a little better here, where the top is going to be much... Uh, uh, You've got a much a much uh, lighter top than you do the sort of bottom parts, and that's that's largely due to your undercoat of that zenithal prime. Of course, I did, and I did uh, sort of cake this guy on uh, pretty thick. Uh, I really like this color, so that's that's why it ended up like that. Now you do want to make sure you don't put it on too thick, 
because you will start losing some of those details if you're really caked on. Uh, contrasts though are very forgiving. You can you can really you can you can really cake it on and it won't be the end of the world. Oh, got a little bit under there. But as you can uh, see in some of these spots, like the under... Oh, did I even get the under part of the gun? <laughs> Don't think it did. Although, actually, that's that's okay. So if you can see uh, underneath the gun there, it's pretty pretty dark. And even with the, the layer of uh, the contrast, it still is quite dark so especially if you have a lighter contrast if you don't um if you don't have a an, an really dark um contrast you'll you'll lose some of that color all right so we have, it looks like we have a question in chat let me clean off the old brush and then i will address that give me just a sec oh, my brush needs a deeper clean all right so um so for these uh for these guys uh, i actually started with a uh, a black primer uh, and you could uh, actually use a gray primer and that would that would sort of take care of the problem of if you have any black sort of uh, parts of the primer remaining, the color won't really show through, um, especially with lighter contrasts. With dark, with this contrast being so dark, it's very forgiving. So even the the sort of very bottom parts. Oh man, <laughs> that's kind of thick there. Um, yeah, if you had a slightly lighter contrast, um, you'd you'd lose a little bit of that color there on those bottom parts. Uh, that's one of the reasons I like the darker contrast, is they're a little bit more forgiving. Um, uh, but yeah, so I started with, with a black primer, and then with a white primer, hit the uh, the top of the, the model. As you can see from, from this guy, if you're looking straight down, uh, he looks basically white. Whereas if you're looking from the bottom, it's still uh, uh, essentially black. Um, and what's really interesting about this one is, even even though this is a black primer, when you get that xenophil going, um, it really lightens up the uh, the black. And honestly, having that sort of having that dynamic range uh, from the very very light to the very very dark, I think is very helpful. Um, it's hard to read on camera, <laughs> um, but on the tabletop, I think it really looks good. Um, but you do. I mean, a gray would, would stop the problem of, uh, you know, things being too dark. But at the same time, I also like to have, like, in the nooks and crannies for it to be particularly dark. And then, yeah, we went over with the uh, the dry brush to get the extra spots to make sure that you get the full coverage of that white. Oh, got a little, little something left over from the, the dry brush there. Uh, and then we did a complete coat of the uh, contrast uh, color and now so while this guy dries because that's the thing it's very convenient that they uh, give you it's a lot of working time to make sure you get a good proper coverage uh, but it also means that you're gonna have to wait a bit before it's done drying and you really want to make sure it is actually done drying before you start putting on any other colors uh, otherwise your colors will begin to mix Oh yeah, so uh, Vincent's talking about using uh, instant colors from uh, Scale 75. I haven't actually had a chance to use those, but I, I'd be excited to see uh, how they work. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I primarily use the, uh, the the Citadels and the Army Painters because that's what is at the at Zulus. So they're, they're the easiest ones for me to get. But I always like sort of branching out and trying uh, new new products and, and that sort of thing. So beforehand, I painted up this here uh, mag cat or Timberwolf, depending on your your particular uh, uh, how, how you heard the names first. And we're going to be diving into the color scheme for this guy. So the color scheme for this, the primary color is this turquoise uh, that we've already covered. Um, but then there are highlights of this purple. 
and then there are some areas of metallic. So this is where it gets kind of interesting. And this is really where the decision making process goes in. So I think, what do we want to start with first? Let's start with, I think we want to start with our metallic. The metallics, I think, are the kind of the easiest ones. Um, as you can see on this guy, I've uh, there's only a couple panels on the leg. There's the barrels of the uh, the guns, um, and then the the vents, as well as the jump jets. So this is not the version with jump jets, so we don't have to worry about that. But as you can see, there are some uh, vents here on the back. Um, some on the back of the legs. We got these uh, backs of the barrels. We got the barrels themselves, <clears throat> and yeah, we've got a couple couple spots. So let's go ahead and dive into that. We have our example model here, and so this is where this is really where the the kind of the fun the fun part hits. This is where you, your your uh, creativity is able to to really hit the road. Um. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and go ahead and hop over to our wet palette, which as you can see got a little bit of the, uh, the contrast on it, but that's okay. Well, generally what I like to do with the uh, with the wet palettes is you put your your paper on uh, on one side uh, and then as it begins to curl up pull it up and then put it onto the other side now I got a little too much water in my wet palette right now so we should drain just a little bit out oh this is really hard to do without hitting the camera and I like I like a wet palette for for keeping the the paints wet during the the given painting session, I don't generally um, use a wet palette for maintaining my paints from session to session. That being said, you absolutely can. If you wanted to, uh, if you're you're working on your your paints and then you have to go for whatever reason, you can you can cover up your your wet palette and come back to it if it's sort of moist enough. I've got to. Do some paint shaking real quick. So the next color we're going to dive into is our lead belcher. Um, there are a bunch of different metallic colors that you can use. Uh, I prefer the the lead belcher just because that's what I'm used to. That humming sound is the uh, my paintster. Don't get me wrong. You can use your hands to uh, stir the paint, but sometimes it's just fun to you know. Let a high RPM motor spin the pants out of your, your paint. So for these pots, because uh, I want to use the palette and dumping them out is a giant pain in the butt, what I'll do is uh, use the back of a thin brush to grab a little bit of the paint and then just roll it onto the wet palette. Uh, I maybe mean, should have used the dry palette. That's okay. Don't forget to clean off the back of your brush. Make sure you don't leave uh, the back of the brush covered in paint. And then for this one, because we're still doing sort of larger sections, I'm going to use our uh, regiment brush. Go ahead and get it a little bit wet. Uh, and now we are going to be switching, you know what, I'm going to switch them now so I don't forget. We're going to be switching our uh, waters because I don't want to mix my metallic water and my non-metallic water. So, let's go ahead and start with the simple stuff. It's easy enough to, uh, to, to do things like uh, gun barrels and some of the leg joints uh, and those vents. So we'll go ahead and start there. And then, then we'll start diving into our sort of other color. Okay, remember where, where I'm focused. There we go. So 
So one of the things that, that I find, so, a lot of times I will tell people that model painting is, is for me much simpler because it's just like painting uh, by numbers. Uh, and then as I'm reminded on occasion, uh, models don't actually have numbers on them. So knowing where to put the different colors can become sort of a challenge. And that's kind of what I want to address today is, you know, looking at the, the, the sort of the style of the model, the look of the model, and trying to think where would be appropriate for the different colors. Um, so the easiest one is that big, what looks like uh, a screw, although, you know, that being a screw would be very strange at this scale. But that seems like something that would be sort of an exposed uh, a metallic sort of thing. Um, more specifically, uh, your clan mechs, being that they are, they have omnipods and can sort of switch out the gear in each of their sets pretty quickly, it would make sense that there would be some parts of the mech that wouldn't be painted because they're meant to be sort of switched out from mech to mech very quickly and easily. Um, and it would be easy to think that that little screw there uh, would be some, well, relatively little, um, would be something that would be sort of uh, used to change out these weapons. So it also wouldn't really get a paint job because it's, you know, constantly hitting wear and tear. And so painting it would be sort of superfluous. Then also the backs of the uh, the barrels. So continuing the, that idea of the, the weapons being sort of a, a metallic sort of thing. means I should probably paint the missiles, uh, the missile launchers and the bunny ears metallic as well. Missile launchers are always great opportunities for sort of a splash of color. Um, because you have all those little, those little points that you can make different colors, which can be a very interesting thing. Now, <laughs> the fun part is, uh, I gotta get into that little spot uh, to, to do some painting. Now, I think what I'm probably going to do um, is have the surround be our purple, just because I think that would be, you know, the, the purple is going to be a highlight. So it's, it's not going to be the sort of primary color. It's going to be on extra uh, kind of extraneous bits. So what, the reason I mention that is because I know that I'm going to be sort of going over the edge part. So if I give a little paint on places it's, it oughtn't to be, like there, for instance, uh, that's okay, because we'll be going back over that with our with our purple color, um, and that'll that'll sort of help out with that. Also, as you'll you'll probably notice, and it's especially apparent when you're playing around with um, stuff that have been zenithal primed and then hit with a contrast, um, when you start putting these single coats on the color becomes very flat, which we will be addressing that in just a little bit by putting a wash on it. But you want to make sure that you maintain that sort of dynamic color range uh, so that if you were to take a picture of your model uh, in black and white, uh, it would have colors that range from black to white. Because um, I think that can, be a th uh, that can be kind of an easy trap where you do your um, do your painting and then um, you're, you put two colors next to each other and it's like oh yeah that looks that looks dynamic and interesting when in fact it's just that there are two colors and yes um, uh, Peter if there uh, if there is a like a pre sort of like this is a paint scheme that you can look at which is I really love those those are always very very nice um, I believe the Battle for Tukiad um, has some great color schemes in there. Um, so that's that's very helpful. And actually, um, admittedly, I did have a sort of, uh, what is it, what do we call it? A reference uh, picture that I used for this. There is, if you look up Clan Cloud, Clan Cloud Cobra, well, it's hard to say, um, color scheme. Uh, one of the first things that will show up on Google is a, Huntsman uh, that has this color scheme on it and so I use that very much as a reference of like alright so where where do you put the the colors where are the metallics um, but yeah there are, there are definitely uh, resources that have 
what the kind of color scheme should look like. All right, got that little guy, got those guys, got the fronts. Now let's go ahead and get these vents. Now these vents are going to be tricky because I do want to keep uh, fixing the uh yeah i'm gonna need to go back and clean up the turquoise that's okay i was actually watching a video the other day um where your you can use your um airbrush cleaner to sort of remove a single layer of paint uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to, to give that a Give that a try. I don't actually have an airbrush, so I have to get get my the cleaner for it. But uh, Midwinter Minis uh, has been doing a, a series with a bunch of collabs because uh, the the painter had a kid recently, or had uh, twins rather. Uh, but that's one of those uh, shows that I really enjoy watching because he's got a lot of really interesting um, sort of speed painting techniques. Uh, the, the techniques, especially for the Battletech minis that I use, definitely are not speed painting ones. Um, I like to, especially because, I, I don't know, I feel like Battletech is one of those games where, you know, you only got like a handful of, of minis on the table. So, like, each one of them can really be its own sort of hero, and you can sort of tell a story with, with the damage on a mech. Um, but if you're playing a game like um, Warhammer or... Um, something that has just a much higher model count, having those speed painting techniques are very, very helpful. So I also, speaking of seeing other people's techniques and uh, enjoying the look of them, I saw a technique on uh, the Battletech Customs and uh, Paint uh, page that where they where they did like heat coming out of these uh, uh, these vents I really like the idea of trying to dive into that and, and giving that a go um, so now remind me are does the um, does the uh, is, are there rear-mounted guns on uh, the the catapult or the catapult, the Mad Cat? Uh, I know there is a version, and I think there was even a version that had like had rear-mounted uh, SRM sixes, which is a, a pretty intense uh, notion. Let me go ahead and hit these little vents as well, just a little extra. And admittedly, the brush I'm using is is pretty big uh, for doing these sort of smaller spots, but we're still kind of early on, so I'm okay with using the bigger brush. Just gotta be, you know, be patient. Take your time. Um, and when you're taking your paint off your uh, your palettes, if you spin your brush, um, it will point your uh, your bristles for you, so you can really maintain that. Uh, Sharp look. Oh, see, that right there, a uh, little white spot, is me missing with the contrast. So I'll have to come back through with the contrast and clean that up. Um, but that's okay, you know. Part of the process, is, you know, you get as much of it on there as possible. You really try to get 100%, but sometimes you miss spots. In the same way that I've gotten a couple uh, spots where there's metallic that should be our base color. So I'll have to go back and clean those up as well. I think I did an episode, actually, of, of going back and actually cleaning up one of the models. Because um, I talk about that a lot, but I don't often have time to really do it. Because, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of painting to be done and not a lot of time to do it in. Alright, so we're going to continue with these vents. Got some stuff under my table. Make sure I'm close enough to the camera. All 
I, I really enjoy, one of the things, and I was mentioning this before, and, and I, I think it's a laser to see now that we're, we're staring at the model, is I feel like these models have really been well designed to sort of give you, there's a lot, a lot of little panels and things that you can really pick out, and I, I really enjoy that for, uh, for, for color schemes like this. Uh, there are definitely some of the, some of the Rol Parthos have significantly less sort of detail. So you have these sort of wide open swaths that you really have to um, uh, play around with, like trying to figure out how you're gonna, what you're gonna, how you're gonna make a big flat surface dynamic. Whereas I think this area, the biggest flattest spot is on those on those guns. So that's both convenient and inconvenient. Uh, this right here is why you don't touch your models uh, while the primer is still drying, because that is my fingerprint. But I kind of like it for damage, so what I'll probably end up doing with that is uh, I'll, I'll do a lot of sort of damage uh, on that area. But remember, let your models uh, dry before you go poke in at the primer. Uh, yeah, so with the prime variant not having... Um, Rear mounted weapons. And actually, now that I'm looking closer at those, I think those are little little handles, like for the hatch. So we're gonna go ahead and paint those metallic as well. And when I'm when I'm doing this, it's a lot of what I'm doing is sort of thinking of you know what what would be metal, what would be what's kind of the highlights. All right, so I think we're good on the upper part. Let's go ahead and move down to those legs. Hmm. I think, yeah, we've got this big joint down here. I think we're going to metallic that up. And I'm trying to think of if there were to be an area that was seeing a lot of rotation, a lot of wear. I mean, you couldn't really get paint to stay on a place that is constantly getting rubbed. Well, that outer part might not have needed it, but that's okay. What also you have to keep in mind is, so partially it's what sort of makes sense in the context, and also partially it's what makes for a visually sort of interesting look. And I think that little bit of uh, silver there in the center I think will look good. Especially because uh, these top panels here, oh, I keep moving too far from my camera, I'm sorry about that guys. These top panels here are going to get that purple, so... Make sure there's a nice range of, of colors. And I like that, and it'll, I think it'll show back up once, once we get the wash on these. Um, there's, you can see sort of the indents where uh, they'd have uh, bolts holding on these panels, which is just a delightful detail. There's a lot of just really fun details on these minis. All right, let's go ahead and do these leg vents, and then I think we'll call that good for our metallics. Let me start diving into our purples. And what's going to be very exciting is before we get to the purples, we're going to wash all the metallics that we've done and bring a lot more of that sort of dynamic range back in. Our lights and darks. Oh, this is a hard one to get to. Oh, yeah. Looks like we missed a little bit at the bottom of the leg there. It's kind of hard to tell with this lighting, but uh, from my angle I can kind of see that which I think brings up a great so a great uh, uh, difference in 
technique or, or approach rather. Um, because if, if you're just painting for tabletop, things like the undersides of legs and things, you don't, as, I, I think as long as they don't like really catch your attention, I think it's perfectly fine to sort of, you know, not go too crazy on the colors for them. But that being said, uh, it's also a good habit to get into to make sure that you're getting good full coverage of, of all the different parts. Let's see. All right. Um, I think. So I think with the toes, what I'm going to end up doing mm, now, we should probably do some, some metal on the toes. So to say, I, I think what I'm going to do is end up um, getting, putting like some mud and dirt on those, but that's like, even if I do mud and dirt, I still want the, the colors to be showing through in it. So as much as I want to move on to washing and purple, let's go ahead and just snag those toes real quick, just to make sure that we don't lose our theme. So one of the things I would very much like to do, but haven't really had the opportunity, is to go, uh, go over um, basing or putting stuff on the on the on the base of the model. I think it really does a lot to to sort of um, uh, to bring the model together. Um, the, the difference between a, a model that is is finished painted and a model that is finished painted with a good basing is is really incredible. All right, yeah, I'm feeling good about the amount of metallic on this. I still want the primary color in the end to be the turquoise, um, but I also uh, and and the purple is going to be the the sort of second most prominent. But I do also still want that metallic to be there. And the thing that, that's good to remember is uh, just because you move to a new color doesn't mean you can't go back to a color that you've already done. All right, so we're going to switch back to our other water here. I'm going to switch back to our... Oh, man. Didn't get all the contrast off my big brush. Got to remember to clean the brushes. I actually need to go through uh, with some some acetone and just clean out all my brushes. They've gotten real, real dirty. So one of the things you can, uh, that I, I do sometimes is I'll, you, you can put a little soap just on the palm of your hand and then, uh, take your, your wet brush and sort of just, uh, do circles in that, in that soap and that'll, help clean out some of the some of the muck don't have any soap right now but even without the the soap that can still go quite a ways to do some cleaning yeah. come back brush so we've got our metallics so let's go ahead and uh, hop over to our nuln oil give that a shake on the fancy paint shaker Savage Wolf. I don't think I'm familiar with the Savage Wolf. Apparently, though, it is our our uh, D configuration, which is the configuration with the rear-mounted SRMs. So then we're going to go ahead and grab our Null Oil, and then just any of the areas that we've done are black. Hit that with the Null Oil. It's happening. Really enjoy the how quickly the known oil can make your metallics just look 
look like sort of more used metal. It's not that same sort of clean, fresh off the factory floor. Um, especially areas like this that have those. Oh, gosh darn it. I stopped doing that. Uh, Areas that have these different like sort of pips really bring out the details of those. Just a little bit there. Don't need a lot for those little spots there. Uh, but like for these, it'll, it really shows off those. Uh, handle details which had sort of disappeared after the initial um, layer of paint there so i don't know if you knew this but on citadels these little guys on the back what they're for is to hold the uh the lid up but as you can see they don't always work so and truthfully i should have it on my what are my dry palette but I am lazy. Oh, I overfilled my brush. Oh dear. Oh. That is okay. Remember, uh, the uh, paintbrush works using uh, the capillary principle. So um, the area between the bristles uh, creates a, a void that the um, paint uh, can consider live in. So it can be used obviously to hold the paint for your, uh, your painting, but then also can be used to sort of soak up uh, in areas that get a little too thick, like what I just did there. Okay. Oh, you know, so here's the question. So I've got this hatch here on the top. A lot of other areas. I think, I think I want to make that hatch metallic because there's going to be a lot of purple that's around it, but I've sort of neglected putting any metallic there in the direct center. So let's, oh, and there's also those vents there. Hmm. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that real quick. We thought we were done, but we're not. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely, I've seen, um, I've seen some people go through and actually convert all their uh, Citadel paints to the droppers, uh, which to me seems like a giant pain in the butt. But uh, at the same time, also, it does kind of make a sort of sense. <sighs> so I'm looking at those little vents on the top. I really don't want to get the area around it. Although what I might do is the little area around it would look really good as just that purple. So I might be okay with getting in there with my, um, with my metallic and making a little bit of a mess. That's good. So the reason I'm thinking about this is I'm trying to think of if I want to wanted to use my detailed brush or just stick with my regiment brush. Um, and I think because I'm going back over, I know I'm going to be going uh, hitting this area with some purple. So I'm okay with using a slightly bigger brush. If I wasn't going to, I probably would have used the character brush to, to not have to try to fix the turquoise. Sixing the turquoise is kind of interesting because you essentially have to go back to the white and then uh, re sort of go over it with the um, contrast because the contrast is very much meant to not cover the color that's underneath it. It's meant to really let you see that color. <clears throat> I think I do want to leave that turquoise underneath oh <laughs> painting parts you can't see keep it in frame rob right. 
really just trying to get the paint in there. It's a little messy, but that's okay. There we go. Perfect. Progress. We'll give us a little bit of time to dive into the purples. You see, that's that's kind of the thing about this this particular style of painting is you're really, really kind of just going for the feel of it, trying to figure out what what feels right. Um, you know, don't be afraid to go over areas a couple times if you think to yourself, you're like, ah, this is this is good, but I want a, a slightly different distribution of uh, of color on here. And don't forget to, we got to wash <laughs> our brush that does the thing. So I'm still, I'm still not sure about the army painter washes. I've been playing around with them a little bit and like, I like the, the dip wash, but the dip wash is so shiny. Like it really leaves a very shiny color to it, which is not as helpful in some circumstances. So. I don't know. I like the Citadel washes. I, I'm really enjoying the sort of ease that the um, contrast paints give me for just being able to whip out things pretty quick. But I want to try... Uh, I, I like the idea of trying... Um, I think Vincent mentioned uh, a different paint that uh, is acts very similar to the contrasts. So I'm going to give that a go. All right. So it's going to be really interesting is figuring out where I'm putting the purple on the, on the, the sort of the canopy near the cockpit. Cause I could just do the whole sort of canopy cover there, but then it'd really be purple. And I'm not sure that I want it to be that purple. Although there are some panels near it that I might play around with. So, although I think what we should start with is the really easy one. The ones that, that I can... I feel very confident I know where the color should be. Just doing a quick shake of my purple. Oh. So we're going to head over to our uh, Negrath Knight. Um, this is our purple. It doesn't say that it's purple, but it's purple. Grab a little bit on the end of a brush, roll it onto the wet palette, and then we're ready to get started. I th I'm gonna still I'm still gonna keep with my regiment brush because I'm not really to the to the tiny fine details just yet. And now now is when we really get to start making some decisions trying to decide where the color is going to be, how it's going to be. Um, if you have uh, a, a reference material, this is really when you'll start using it. Um, so for this one, my first couple places that I'm going to, I'm going to hop onto is this, uh, this gun. It has just such an easy line here of that uh, sort of barrel front. And this, this purple is going to get significantly lighter, but right now, since this is our base color, it's quite dark. I got... Oh, it's falling out of my hand. Yeah. It's a nice, easy sort of starting spot. And then we've got continuing up the arm. What I'm looking for when I'm, when I'm painting these is just sort of isolated, smaller panels that I can uh, keep the, the color sort of just in a, in a very sort of cordoned off area. So like this panel here is perfect because there's very easy sort of... Um, or like edges to it. 
I really want to make sure that uh, these highlight colors are in sort of contained paneling. Now I could do this shoulder part, but I, I don't want to get it too, I don't want to go too crazy with my purple. I want there to be splashes of purple, but not like, you know, not, um, not completely purple. If you were going for more of a color scheme of like an even, uh, kind of an even mix of color, uh, where you have about as much uh, turquoise as you do purple, then yeah, I would do that panel. But for this one, because because I want the primary, I want the the primary sort of look of the model as a whole to be that that uh, I guess it's not turquoise, it's teal. It's turquoise. It is turquoise. Uh, I want the focus to be the turquoise. Um, so I'm making sure to. In my face. Uh, I'm making sure to only do little bits of, of purple here and there. And I'm very sorry my lighting for some reason is making this purple <laughs> blend in with my turquoise. Uh, which is something to kind of think about when you're when you're doing your coloration. See, now that I'm looking at it, I can tell that these um uh, the surrounds on the bunny ears don't have that same sort of delineation that I was looking for. So, looks like I'm going to have to actually do slightly different panels. Oh, now that I'm looking at it too, that as a metallic I think would look very good. So we'll come back to that. So I've got these three panels. But I only want to do one of them in the purple. So I don't again I don't wanna I don't wanna like just completely purple out the whole mech. Just little just little bits of purple, you know. When when three panels are an option, just do one. Uh however for these top ones, I am gonna do two of them purple. So I might do all three. Since I'm not doing the surround on here, I think I'm going to do all three of these. Um, you know what? We can do both. So let's do the t outside two first. So we got that. Yeah, no, it needs to have all three of them be the, the purple. And with the when you're doing your your highlight color like this, remembering to not go too far out to the sides is kind of an important thing because you want to you want to let that your your base color sort of show out the sides to make it look like these were panels that have were painted purple over top of the 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 turquoise. Yeah, and with this with this part it's really it's really down to sort of feel you just you gotta kind of look at the model and think to yourself what what makes sense color wise it's also fun is when you're playing around with these extra colors like this you can really sort of bring out the different um uh, the different armor panels. Uh, ooh, so we've got a question um, about uh, uh, getting Citadel paints, keeping Citadel paints from drying out. So, kind of. One of the things that I've noticed um, in their sort of attempt to create a more ergonomic pot, um, they have created a great opportunity. Uh, for paint to crust up on the lid. I'll show you what I mean here in just a moment. See, and this is what I meant by um, by putting the purple here. I can cover up the the extra metallics that I metallic mess that I made. So there's a lot more purple that's going to go into this guy, but we are unfortunately out of time. I may return to this and continue purpling uh, next week. 
or not a week after next, uh, because I'm really enjoying kind of going over where the colors go. But before I go, so one of the things that I've noticed with my Citadel pots is, and you can kind of, see, you can definitely see it on this one, that purple isn't supposed to be there. <sighs> Oh no, so the, sorry, uh, I just saw another question in chat. So the purple I'm using is the uh, Negrath Knight, which is a base paint, um, which is why it covers so much uh, better than the um, the contrast. It, it really sort of covers up the, the colors. Um, as far as keeping the paints um, from drying out though, the, the thing to really do is to make sure, well, <laughs> and it's done it here, which I need to make sure it doesn't, um, so it will build up paint along here, and that will make it so that it doesn't seal. Uh, one of the things you can do is before you've uh, before you've shaken your paint, you can kind of get in here and um, make sure that the the pot isn't um, you're not getting extra residue along the side here, and then just making sure that they are really well closed. So these guys really need to sort of squish them to make them closed. Um, I've also, uh, I've gotten a, a paint shaker. That's what you've been hearing on the side. Apparently those are really good at um, reconstituting your sort of dried paints. So, all right. Uh, unfortunately, that is my time for today. Uh, we'll be returning next week. Uh, I think we're going to be doing some terrain painting next week, uh, more sort of D&D. &D, but the week after that, I think I'm going to return to this guy because um, I really want to keep doing some purples on him. Uh, I feel like we got started, but we didn't really get a chance to, to really dive into it. So uh, thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to leave comments. I do keep an eye on the videos after they've been uh, gone up. Uh, this will also be going up on YouTube. Um, so I guess if, if you're already here on Facebook, I don't think you'll need to have it on YouTube. But, uh, but yeah, if you have any questions for me, let me know. Uh, thank you for watching, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.